um, thank you for coming. Uh, it's us against John Kerry. Um, I suspect you'll have a bigger audience, uh, but thank you very much for coming. This is very much uh, a last-minute session, which is why there's almost no detail in the programme, because uh, it was felt that this is something which has to be addressed, uh, depending on... Um, uh, we weren't sure whether there might be other events, but certainly when we were talking about this last week, it was felt that this is something which we have to look at. And it is about securing open societies. Um, and we have many people here who have very clear views about it. Let me emphasize it is about securing open societies as opposed to discussing necessarily extremism as such. Um, how should societies, though, respond to the rise of extremism, populism, and nationalism? And we do hope to be joined by the former head of Norwegian intelligence. And after all, we have to remember that Anders Breivik committed dreadful events on Otoya Island uh, four years ago. Uh, and he was an extremist as well. Uh, and uh, that uh, caused immense heart-searching and difficulties for the Norwegian government. We hope to be joined by him uh, shortly. But I make that point because it isn't just about Charlie Hebdo. It's about something far broader. And each of you will have your own perspectives depending on the countries that you come from. And at the moment, what we're seeing in Germany with the anti-Islam movement, uh, Pegida, um, and what they've been doing in Dresden, it's interesting overnight that the leader has had to step down because he uh, took a selfie of himself um, disguised as Hitler with a moustache and short haircut. So he's had to stand down, showing the power of the media. But I don't really want this to be a discussion about the media. What I would like, and some of you have seen how well this has worked in the last couple of days, is please do use your, um, your uh, tablets or smartphones, and I'm not going to uh, become brand friendly here. If you want to um, hashtag, there is um, there the hashtag open society, because it means that I can then get an idea as you're listening to the panelists and others in the audience, your views, and we can, you can help drive the direction of travel if you think it's going in the wrong direction or you would like it to go in uh, another direction. So we've got an hour to discuss this. It is, to underscore, securing open societies. And uh, joining us um, uh, across the, uh, the platform from me, Abdallah bin Baya, welcome, uh, who is president of the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies uh, from the United Arab Emirates. And um, that's one of the most, named one of the most influential Muslims. He was named one of the most influential Muslims um, uh, between 2009 and 2013. And he said very clearly, we must declare war on war so the outcome will be peace upon peace. And he's um, issued a fatwa against ISIS fighters and against Boko Haram in Nigeria. We're also joined by Kenneth Roth, uh, Ken, welcome, um, who is Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, based in the United States, but um, prolific and very influential right around uh, the world. Also by Jean Bogo, welcome, um, who is President of Internews USA. And I just want to ask you to just explain what Internews is. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering local media and freedom of expression around the world. We're not a news organization at all. We're about capacity building in some of the hardest to work countries where there hasn't traditionally been a media. So we're working in Burma, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Central African Republic. You call it Burma, not Myanmar. Myanmar. Okay, <laughs> right, thanks. Uh, and finally, up here on the platform um, is Patrick uh, Chapat, normally based in Los Angeles. But I'm coming to you last because I want them in the gallery over there to put up, uh, my colleagues to put up um, the kind of thing that you do. You're a cartoonist. Uh, and you're an editorial cartoonist for the New York Times, for Switzerland's uh, Le Ton, and also Amzontag. Uh, could we put up the first uh, cartoon? Because this is what Patrick drew uh, within a few hours of what happened uh, at Charlie Hebdo. Uh, without humour, we are all dead. And the cracked pen in the bottom left-hand corner. Now, Patrick, I'd like to ask you to describe that, because this, of course, is emblematic of an open society which brought four million onto the streets of, of France with all the leaders there as well, many of them, 40 um, big leaders um, coming to join the march. What was going through your mind uh, as you drew that? Well, on that day, um, Wednesday, uh, I woke up to that nightmare. Uh, still have a hard time waking up from that nightmare. You were in Los Angeles. I was in Los Angeles, so um, learning the news with a time difference. And I had to work, uh, the New York Times called me and asked me to do a cartoon right away. So I had to process that while doing cartoons and talking, because we haven't stopped talking for, for two weeks, us cartoonists and people from the media and society. So this shows that it has struck everybody. 
Uh, it has truckers in our hearts and minds. It's, it's not about cartoons. We have all felt that it's about something much, much bigger. And um, it's very disorienting when people who bring, bring us this humor are themselves the target of, of tragedy. Um, it's, uh, it's very deep. It's, uh, we feel that what is at stake is as important as the air that we breathe. It is uh, freedom. It is humor. And it's, in a way, it's, uh, uh, it's the sacred against the sacred, because on one side you have religion and sacred beliefs, and on the other, so on the other side you have a very uh, deep-rooted um, uh, need for freedom of expression. And you know what? I could have passed for the most clever man in the world at some point in 2005 when a German magazine coming to interview me. The guy asked me, what do you think is the greatest issue of our time? That's quite a question. <laughs> and then out of nowhere, I answered, I, well, maybe the fact that we are in a globalized world, and at the same time, we have communities that are more and more walled in. And the, the collision of the two might be, might be a big issue. And it sounded weird, so they didn't publish my <laughs> <laughs> remark. But just two weeks after that, the Danish cartoon controversy happened. And I think it's the first conflict of globalization, it's a cultural conflict, it's a cultural shock. How much, when you were thinking about what you were going to put on paper, did you think, how far dare I go because of what's happened to Charlie Hebdo? In other words, what you might draw, providing it's published, that that might lead to anger about you? Did you constrain yourself at all in what you said and what you drew? In the last two weeks? Yeah. I want to say that for us, uh, this struggle between uh, the freedom of expression and the responsibility that goes with it dates back from 2005. And but what I'm trying to get at is... But now it has become bloody. It has become really tragic. And there is the fear, I mean, there is the, the possibility of, of, of death. Well, the reason I'm just pushing you on a very personal basis is because a lot of um, newspapers and television stations, particularly because of national laws, decided not to even show the follow-up front cover of right. Charlie Hebdo because of... Uh, their fears and also because of the legal constraints. Did you feel at any point that I can't be quite as free, I can't express myself quite as freely as I feel I should? You know what? I want to say no, and I've said no, and I've answered no to that question. The real, the real answer, the candid one, is I don't know in the long term how this will affect us, cartoonists, uh, writers, journalists. There is this, this shadow. But what I want to say... Freedom of speech is not, I mean, you, you don't have to feel obliged to draw Muhammad all of a sudden. You don't have to feel obliged to even publish the front page of Charlie Hebdo. Freedom of speech is a, precisely a judgment between what you feel you need to do, who you are talking to, what your audience is. That's how I feel it. And I'm trying to do the same job I was doing before 2005 and before two weeks ago. Patrick. Which is, you know, there is a, a responsibility. I'm working for... Uh, mainstream newspapers, not for Charlie Hebdo. It's a different um, kind of job. Help us frame the discussion for the next 50, 55 minutes because there's a second cartoon, which I think is important to help us understand where you see the dilemmas now. Explain this one. Well, uh, I, you know, uh, I've been asked uh, very often if I'm worried for myself, if I'm afraid. I'm more worried for democracy, for society right now, and I see the use that can be made of cartoons and cartoonists. I think cartoonists should not be hostage of anyone's, you know, of, uh, they sh we shouldn't be soldiers in a war. And there is that risk, there is a trap behind us of more extremism, of this issue being used by both sides. It was the case in a way with the, uh, the Danish cartoons. It might be the case again. I think Charlie Hebdo cartoonists, they don't want to be the best friends of the far right and of Marine Le Pen in France. And uh, we know that both extremes are using this issue as a symbolic one. They're using cartoons as a pretext for many other things. Right. Um, I should say, perhaps, uh, for Sheikh Bin Baya, let me just translate so your interpreter can translate for you up on that screen. Uh, in the top left-hand corner, the balloon says, now I fear both Islamic and lower down and anti-Islamic radicalism and c'est la guerre, it's war. Uh, so that the, the sheikh is familiar with what we're showing um, and all of those who, of you who speak English uh, can understand. Right, let's now try and broaden the context about securing societies, securing open societies. Ken, um, at um, Human Rights Watch, you spend all your time 
uh, monitoring and almost giving a, a grade to where there are open societies and where they're under threat. How would you now define the threat when it comes to securing open societies? And has what happened with Charlie Hebdo in any way, in your view, changed it fundamentally? I don't know about fundamentally, but, but it is, it's a challenge. In other words, the, traditionally the debate, there was actually even a split between America and Europe on this, where in America, which tends to sort of um, believe in even more open free expression than in Europe, you could advocate violence so long as you didn't incite violence. Inciting could be prohibited. Advocacy was permitted, protected. Europe was more willing to suppress advocacy of violence. What we have here with Charlie Hebdo is neither. This was not, it, no one at Charlie Hebdo was telling anybody to go commit an act of violence. The issue with Charlie Hebdo is what happens when the speech offends someone? And should we be able to suppress the speech just because somebody finds it offensive? So this, we're into whole new territory. And if we get at all serious about suppressing merely offensive speech, I feel that an open society would be very much in jeopardy. You're monitoring the intelligence agencies and what governments and how they're reacting. And um, uh, Andrew Parker, the head of uh, MI5, gave a speech literally a couple of weeks ago. It's only the second speech he's ever given. It happened to be the day after Charlie Hebdo. But he made very clear the dilemmas that are faced, where the society expects freedom but also wants security. Well, I've got to say, that speech really bothered me. He was exploiting this tragedy to try to pursue his political agenda. And, and what he was pushing for was really more of an opportunity to, to mass vacuum up our communications data and even our communications content. And second, he was fighting. But he says that's the price we have to play, well, yes, pay so for a, security. No, exactly. And, and the second thing, just to put on the table, and I'll answer this, is that um, with the Snowden revelations, many of the internet and phone companies have reacted by encrypting. And he's saying, we've got to keep a back door. We have to allow ourselves to get past this encryption. Now, what's interesting, if you look at what happened in Paris, um, this is not a situation of the intelligence agencies lacking adequate information. Um, they were flooded with information. They had so much information that they couldn't follow up. And so these, all the attackers were known to the police, but the police made a decision, these guys aren't as important as some others. We're going to go after the people who visited Syria. We're going to ignore the people who merely visited Yemen. So you know what that suggests to me, first of all, is that we have been investing too much in information collection and not enough in the analysis and follow-up. And on the question of the encryption, you know what, the, these brilliant terrorists, you know the encryption that they used? They borrowed their wives' mobile phones and talked to each other through these second phones. Now, you know, this is not rocket science. Again, it shows that, you know, while, while MI5 is pushing for these high-tech solutions, we need some of the ordinary solutions of people actually following up and, and, and doing the legwork to pursue the people we know. So quickly, are open societies now under threat, particularly because of the counterterrorism imperative which has been created by Charlie Hebdo and other events as well, and the way governments are now reacting? Yes, I think that we're going to get a reaction to where some people are going to say we have to restrict offensive speech and, and offensive speech, you know, there's always somebody who's going to be offended. So that's a big threat. And second, the right to privacy is not distinct from the right to free expression because um, many people need privacy in order to speak. If you live in China, you need to be able to speak anonymously. You, you, you need your privacy or the government's going to come after you. Even in, in you know, societies like the West, um, journalists are having a hard time getting governmental sources to speak to them when they can't trust that the conversations can be private because the governmental sources clam up. So yes, an open society is very much in jeopardy because of the reaction to Charlie Hebdo. I should just tell you what Andrew Parker said at the end of his speech. My sharpest concern as Director General of MI5 is the growing gap between the increasingly challenging threat and the decreasing availability of capabilities to address it. So he was it, highlighting a dilemma. It, exactly, and, and that's the wrong dilemma because what, what Charlie Hebdo shows is that this was not about inadequate information. It was about inadequate investment in following up. Right. Let me now, if I may, uh, Sheikh bin Baya, can I come to you and ask what your assessment is, and you all need headsets here, um, uh, what is your assessment of the impact particularly of the Charlie Hebdo event, the 17 deaths there, but also the repercussions 
and what governments have now tried to do to tighten uh, the issue of security. In other words, the possibility of an open society being under increased threat now. In the name of God. The answer to that is, first of all, to answer about the, the actual challenge. The challenge is about balance. Yeah, and like one walking on a tightrope. Yeah, and it's easy to fall. Yeah, and he could also, if, if he doesn't fall, he can reach his, his objective. How do we balance this affair without any justification for Charlie Hebdo? I mean, the, the, it was a murder, and it was, uh, I am totally against it, and it was completely against the law, Islamic or otherwise, and I've been on record saying this. But in terms of the sacredness of the religion and, and, and freedom of speech, we have to use some uh, quick words here. There's, there's a right and a responsibility. How do, we, how do we find that balance between the responsibility and the right? Yeah, people have a right to speak freely, but you also have a responsibility that you don't insult or mock uh, other people. There has to be some sense of, of responsibility. So we, ha we have to define you know, the behavior of people, that, that people are responsible for what they do. They, they, there are responsibilities. So he's, he, this comes from knowledge and ethical behavior, and people have to have more ethical behavior. Yes, people are free, but they're also responsible on their actions. If you, if you, draw, a, 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 if you draw a cartoon, and if you know this is going to mock and harm other people, then... then at that point, you, you, what, what you did is to harm other people. It's, it's, if, if it's merely for that, something's wrong with that. We have to avoid that, just ethically. We, uh, it's, it's necessary that, you know, for instance, anti-Semitic cartoons, we don't accept these. You know, if you harm, you know, things that harm people's religion, mock their religions or mock their, uh, their ethnicities, it's wrong. You can, you can, you can uh, criticize religion. You can do all these things, and, and but you can't. But insulting people and mocking people—this is a civilizational problem. It's about civility. It's, so one group says this is a good thing, another person says it's a bad thing. Like you listen to a, 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 a pigeon, uh, and some say that it's, it's beautiful, and, it's, and others say no, it's an ugly sound. So this is a different opinion. So one sees uh, a kind of singing, and another sings an ugly sound. Same with weeping. Some people will see weeping, and other people see moaning. I'd like to just ask you this, though. Um, we are talking about securing open societies. And I apologize for those um, online. You're not getting the translation at the moment, but I can't uh, repeat uh, what Sheikh Bayer has said. Um, because what I'd like to move on to is when you issued your fatwa against ISIS fighters and against Boko Haram, quickly, what was the reaction that you got? But more imp uh, equally importantly, what happened in Nigeria when it brought together Christians and Muslims, what you said? Did it have an effect on the politics of dealing with Boko Haram and what they were doing in northeast Nigeria? Your intervention, in other words, helping, you hoped, helping to secure um, some kind of open debate about this within Nigeria. I wanted to, from this action, I wanted two things. I had two objectives. One of them was to convince, persuade these youth that are going into these things that this is a wrong path. It's, it's not a path to paradise. The second thing, I wanted to persuade also those that it's possible to persuade amongst scholars that give fatwas supporting uh, things like Boko Haram or Daesh, that these are wrong. 
that these are actually against the religion. And this is this is a problem that we're really suffering from. And open societies also suffer from, you know, they have multicultural, multi-religious societies. You, Denmark has to understand the culture of a theocratic, of, 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 a, of a religious society. You, know, you have to understand the, 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 that we've got idiots. And scholars also have Right, because my final question to you is, do you are using open society to condemn ISIS, to condemn Boko Haram. Do you feel under threat yourself for making these condemnations? I think crazy people, yeah, you have to be afraid from them. You're, if, 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 you, if you attack somebody, they'll attack you. This is, uh, this, this is a problem. Uh, he said uh, you have to fear crazy people, and if, people, um, if you attack them, then you have to fear that they might attack you. Now, Jean, um, what's your reflection? Because you're not just here as someone from the media. Because you're here because of the work you, you have been doing in many other parts of the world where you're trying, particularly in a place like Myanmar, which remains under quasi-military leadership still, despite what they say. Uh, there are 14 different wars going on in that country, and all of them are, are labelled some, in some way extremist activities by, the, by Tencent, the president, and others. What's your reflection across all those other areas you're working in? Well, I'm, I am worried about sort of a double chilling effect on civil society and on, on open government. I mean, the first one is the, the, the attack on freedom of expression, freedom of press. There is journalists right now, it is an incredibly dangerous profession. It's gotten more dangerous over the last decade. And the journalists that I work with in all sorts of countries acro across the world are the ones who are actually getting hit, hurt the most. I mean, the 85% the of journalists killed in Iraq were Iraqi journalists and not international journalists. And so there's, a, there's been an incredible pressure on journalism and freedom of expression anyway, and I think that this is going to harm that. This is making the journalism is much broader than the traditional journalist. Yeah. Everyone out there is, some, I don't like the phrase, but is a kind of citizen journalist. But there are I'll literally get to that. I want to get to that point on Burma too. So I'm worried about that one piece because uh, jour journalists are not combatants, but sometimes are viewed as combatants, and that is hurting freedom of expression broadly. The other piece, though, is the reaction and sort of the, the, the government actions. And when we put too much in the security, there's all sorts of governments out there that are using exactly the examples of Europe and the United States and in our anti terrorism efforts to clamp down on civil society in other countries. And so you get this double, you get hit on both sides, basically, sort of hurting open society, hurting civil society. In the context of uh, Myanmar, it is interesting. I, again, I, I speak from the perspective of what's happening in the media there. You have a double thing happening there as well. The, some of the most exciting openness you could imagine in sort of opening up the information space there that was just unimaginable you know, five years ago and, and, and happening now. But in that same space, in the same heroes of media and information and journalism there, you're finding hate speech sort of flowing through. And most of it's coming through the social media. So that's sort of the wonder of having social media in, in Yangon. Is, is amazing, but in what we're seeing is an incredible amount of hate speech that's sort of fueling those conflicts in, in the country. And so it's, it's, the openness is triggering other things, and it's, it's, it's a challenging, delicate civil society, so these types of external pressures only make it all the more challenging. Have you sensed a reaction after the horror of what happened in Paris? From our journalistic partners, no. And I've actually been surprised by that. I and mean, we have, there's been different situations and incidents uh, uh, that we have worried about it, where there have been attacks on, for example, we have a lot of programs in Afghanistan, we have a lot of partners in Afghanistan, and there have been other incidents that have triggered attacks on you know, radio stations in Afghanistan because of something that happened in the West. We didn't get the same response this time, which I'm pleased with. I mean, that is, that is I guess, a, a one, one for civil society there, which is good. Well, I want to open it up to others, um, but do you believe that um, uh, securing uh, open societies is now under threat, despite the proliferation of digital capability to have open societies. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I'm. 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 You hear, did you hear a hedge in my voice? Yes. I, mean, I, I see so I much. I saw it as well. Amazing. I see so much courage. I see so much amazing work out there. I, I see that a complete commitment 
in these countries in which we work to, to an open and civil society, people w willing to die for it on a, on a regular basis. And so I see tremendous hope with that. In fact, I take it back. All right, what I, do you I, see, uh, Ken Roth, and then I'll come to you, Patrick, the tensions here about the digitization of the space. Well, Everyone can, can say something, there's empowerment, but at the same time, governments are trying to clamp down. Well, it's a real cat and mouse game right now. In other words, the, the emergence of social media has been tremendously empowering because you know we used to have to depend on the BBC to get the world out and the word out, and today everybody can get the word out. So that democratization of the megaphone is very important. But the flip side of this is that you know because social media, by definition, is all happening online, it's easy to monitor, and so governments are investing enormous resources. You know, not simply anymore, you know, the Chinese firewall blocking the Chinese people from gaining access to the web, but rather monitoring social media users. And it's, you know, it used to be that the dissident might be whispering in a corner. Here, it's all public, it's all online, it's all available for the government to monitor and clamp down. And so we're seeing both happen, this explosion of voices, but also an intensification of the repression. Patrick, your view about the, this tension and which way it's moving? Well, first, um, kind of replying to the notion that, uh, uh, I mean, cartoonists don't go out and, uh, you know, think what, who I'm going to insult today. Let's just remind that uh, political cartooning, 99% of it is about issues. It's really making a point on something, giving a comment, uh, picking up at, at what, what's wrong, and in the process you may offend some people or a lot of people, but it's, uh, it's not the first goal and the first aim. Then you can have any, anyone, look at that, it's just paper and pen. Uh, anyone in, uh, can do an offensive cartoon, and the thing is now it can be posted and, and it can be spread all over the world. Your more sense of decency, uh, sense of responsibility, all those things are very cultural. Some things are not meant to be seen Cartoons by Charlie Hebdo, 40,000 circulation in France, they were not meant to be seen by peasants in Afghanistan. So how do we, what do we do with that? That's, 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 the, main, that's the main issue. It's the, all right. Well, I, I would like to say that, to put it bluntly, an open society, because our societies need to remain open, is one where uh, you are free to say and to draw what you want, and in a way they are free to kill us. Commenting on this, uh, Mah Mohan Murti out there has said a blunt pen is as deadly and dangerous as a razor sharp sword, and both both must be used with restraint. Uh, Vince Fierro, it, uh, an open society is one that does not give in to people that want to close it. It includes anyone that respects the other. Now look, let's broaden the debate. And you saw uh, walking in Kiel Grandhagen from Norway. Welcome. I know you haven't been able to hear what we've been saying up to now, but we are talking about securing open societies. And we've mentioned um, the head of uh, MI5 in Britain, uh, not just because I come from Britain, talking about the dilemmas now. And one of the things I've made clear is that this is not just about Charlie Hebdo and Muslim extremism. This is about extremism in many forms. And I mentioned Norway. And I just wonder if you could uh, help us understand the challenge to a country like Norway. After all, Breivik was doing it for a completely different reason on Otoya Island four years ago. And you were involved in handling this. What you've discovered about dealing with those who are determined to do something extreme, whatever their reasons for it. Well, thank you, and again, apologies for coming late. I came, just came from another panel. Um, thank I you want, anyway for coming. I want you uh, to know that, uh, that I am the director of an external service, so I did not have uh, direct responsibility for how Norway handled the Breivik But you uh, sit incident. in the National Security Council. Well, I do, and I, uh, obviously, uh, I, uh, and as an observer, you could uh, see how that was um, done. Uh, I think everyone that uh, watched this, whether it was from the inside or, of Norway or from the outside, would notice that it, this was a, an enormous national tragedy to Norway. Uh, on the other hand, I think it was handled both by our political leadership and by the population in general in a, a very decent manner. Uh, I think, uh, but there were quite a few professional casualties who lost their jobs over it. 
Absolutely. The police. Well, uh, to, to some extent, but on the other hand, uh, I also think that uh, that uh, as a country as a whole, it was handled in a decent way. It was a decent court procedure uh, done for Mr. Breivik, and uh, the uh, evaluation that was done in the society afterwards was um, uh, taken very seriously, and a number of corrective measures have been applied, and some will need to be applied also in the future. But Norway is seen as a very open society, a, a, very, a rich open society as well, which doesn't tend to look at the reaction that there was immediately. It must be due to migration and probably Muslim, and then it turned out to be Breivik. Give us an idea in a couple of minutes of the heart searching that went on for you and of course the politicians you answer to about how you maintain Norway as an open society but knowing that this kind of thing could happen and how many was it, 76 killed on Otoya? Right. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely uh, right. Uh, uh, that was a, uh, a big challenge to the society. Was it resolved? I think that uh, a lot of measures have uh, been implemented since uh, the attack that uh, uh, makes us better prepared for something that will come in the future. The problem, of course, is that you probably won't have history re repeating itself, and uh, the next uh, threat that we may face may be very different uh, from uh, this one. Do you think Norway is a less open society as a result of what happened, and you've had a change of government as well? Not really, uh, but I think based on the situation that uh, has developed also since uh, the, uh, the incident with Mr. Breivik um, in Europe in general and, in, in, and on a global basis, also has forced Norwegian politicians to uh, consider uh, other types of measures to ensure uh, national security and to, un uh, to ensure public security than we had uh, in the past. Can I just ask you one other technical question within the bounds of whatever you can say? You also had another terrible event two years ago in the desert of Algeria mm. involving your national oil company, Statoil, mm. um, when uh, a group of Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb took over the Inamenas gas plant and you lost a lot of people. It was a massive problem for you, for the Brits, uh, for Statoil, uh, for BP and also the Algerians. Did you have any inkling that that was going to happen? No, I mean, uh, that, that was more on, on, on my territory, so to say, because it was something happening abroad. Um, we uh, did not have intelligence, uh, concrete intelligence, uh, suggesting that this could happen. Uh, but on the other hand, I think anybody who followed the uh, developments in North Africa at that time realized that at some point this could happen somewhere uh, in that uh, region. Uh, uh, and uh, also there, we have gone through some soul searching and seen uh, and looked into how our service, in a better way, uh, can try to monitor uh, the activities of these uh, uh, these groups uh, and be better in uh, uh, maybe uh, forecasting uh, future events. All right, they're the, the the real challenges for someone in your position. Thanks, for, thanks very much for joining us. Let me get some more more views. Uh, Oliver Matinen, um, uh, can I ask you? You're author of Violence in God's Name, and you explore the roots of violence. Reflect on what you've been hearing, particularly about the the ways of guaranteeing. Um, an open society and securing an open society, then I'll get some more views as well. I think, first of all, it's important to define what we mean by an open society. And for me, it should be a society that offers real opportunity to, to individuals to contribute to the development of that society and to the shaping of its future. Now, I think it's not a matter of education. It's not a matter of material wealth but it's a matter of feeling you're a stakeholder and contributing. Now, when that is absent, I think there is a real risk that individuals within any society will look for alternative outlets. Their, their frustrations, their anger or whatever. And I think in, in, the, in that situation, they become very vulnerable, vulnerable to different types of narratives that offer them a sense of identity, purpose, reshaping the whole of society. And I think for me that, that is one of the real um, issues that we need to address in the present day. Let me go to David Rosen, uh, a rabbi, international director of interreligious affairs uh, for the American Jewish Committee. 
uh, in Israel. Uh, David, what is your reflection? Um, we've seen particularly the response of Prime Minister Netanyahu um, and the speed at which he went to Paris and joined the other uh, world leaders. But more broadly, um, given the dilemmas of your state of securing an open society, reflect on that for us, can you? So you're asking me not in my capacity in terms of With international interfaith relations, but as an Israeli? In whichever way you want to answer it. Because I think these are, two, these are not the same question. Um, there is an issue of a, a broad international context where, paradoxically, if you like, the blessings of modern technological diverse society are also its curses where we have opportunities that we've never had before, but yet the capacities for just a couple of nutcases or one to do um, terrible things on a scale are unprecedented. And how do you manage to be able to ensure that these opportunities are not abused? And then there's a context of how a particular conflict, therefore, is brought in to uh, this broader context. And uh, I think that... Um, you are always going to find the need um, on part of people to find an outlet for their frustrations. And where there are conflicts that are at the cutting edge of civilizational relationship, historical relationships, uh, the questions of their own uh, engagement with tradition, modernity, uh, those conflicts are going to be used and abused by vested interests. Do you want to be more specific to me? Yes, please. No, then go ahead and ask me. No, um, <laughs> I, what, what do you want to say, David, about, about where you believe this is going and the kind of ru potential rupture that has been created by Charlie Hebdo, but also with these other issues. We're talking about extremism in so many other countries too, including in a country like Norway, even if it's only one man. Yes, I think it goes back to what Sheikh bin Bayo was saying. It's a question that we have to respect these freedoms, we have to secure these freedoms. Uh, as also, as Oliver McTurnan said, we've got to give people a sense that their uh, security will come about by a sense where people have a stake within their society. If they feel they have nothing to live for, they will only have something to die for. We have to work to guarantee that these people are engaged within those societies. But we have to try to develop a culture that is not only free and open, but is responsible. That's the area that is to do both with political, civic society, religious leadership, in which people have a sense of, um, of um, care and respect for one another, and therefore d don't abuse those particular freedoms. It's very interesting that the President, President Hollande got very excited about the burning of the French flag, which um, understandably so. But nevertheless, that was clearly for him somebody who crossed the line. It was more significant for him than necessarily crossing the line of insulting somebody's identity. I think all these point to dilemmas within modern society of where we have to take into account how our actions can lead to consequences that reverberate and boomerang on us. Right. So it's a delicate balance. All right. Well, let's get another voice. Matt, uh, Mathieu Ricard, uh, you're, you're a Buddhist monk. Uh, you've been uh, a Buddhist monk uh, studying Buddhi Buddhism in the Himalayas, or Himalayas, I should say, for 40 years. What's your reflection from uh, your religion? So first, I think there's two kinds of uh, fights for open society. One is a Within a totalitarian system, you're fighting for freedom of uh, opinion, freedom of expression, freedom of movement, so for basic freedom. So that's a fight to achieve open society. Now, within an already functional democracy like France, of course, there's a fight to preserve that, but as it was said, it also comes with responsibility. And so if you offend someone, too bad if that only stops there, that people are offended and you know, they have to make with it. But if that goes further in terms of consequences, and you know that in the, within a few days, there will be five dead in Niger, or 10 days in Afghanistan, what was the case in the first place, then you have to think, you know, imbue freedom of expression with a sense of consideration, altruistic consideration of others. Because I will not want to be the cause of 15 people dead, because people have very simplistic views, they react very, you know, with gut feelings, they, are, they lack education. So there's other indirect way to open the society to education, to, to different ways of achieving this openness. Ken, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I'd like to address this concept that's come up with, with a few of the comments about um, the distinction between a right and a responsibility. And this can be understood in two different ways. Um, the dangerous way is to say you only have a right if you exercise it responsibly. And the reason that's dangerous is because you're basically telling governments, whatever you think is responsible, um, you can censor anything else. 
and you can be sure that governments will will define responsibility by things that you know don't criticize us you know and, and you very quickly don't have a right anymore the alternative way to look at that is to say you've got a right to say pretty much whatever you want but we will use various tools of persuasion to encourage you to exercise that right responsibly. And that's fine. In other words, governments, people, civil society, religious leaders, by all means should urge all of us to exercise our right responsibly. But that's very different from saying that right is contingent, that we can be censored if we don't exercise that in somebody else's view responsibly. Let's pick up on that. Uh, Jean and uh, Sheikh Baya, do you, do you agree with Ken Roth on this? Jean? I do agree with that. I mean, I think it's, it's just too hard. The, the limits, and again, the countries in which we work, the limits would be very, very extreme. And so I, I couldn't agree more. Patrick? Uh, isn't it interesting that um, we are all say, saying the same thing? <laughs> like, I think I was the first to speak about well, freedom. Should we just say yes and move on? <laughs> freedom goes with responsibility. And that cartoonists, since the Danish cartoons have been really struggling with that notion that, you know, we understand there is a new world where um, you need to criticize and to be able to criticize absolutely freely. And at the same time, we are trying hard to listen. We need to do both at the same time. But then um, there is a perimeter in any society for freedom of speech. It's uh, either the, 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 you know, the media you work for, the audience, or it is the, the legal perimeter. There are laws. It's in France. You can be condemned for defamation. It, it's in the French <coughs> law about the freedom of press. Charlie Hebdo uh, went to uh, was was uh, <coughs> dragged in court because of the of the cartoons offending Islam. Well, the judge decided uh, they were uh, it, they were not condemned. So there is a perimeter. We don't have international laws. We don't have an international law about what's decent or about blasphemy. What is the, what is the answer? Uh, do you want the perimeter to, to change? Um, All right, we're raising know, a lot of so questions it's, here. It's really the question about even if you don't agree with, you know, to quote the whole, the, the whole quote, if you don't agree with what they are saying, we need to fight for them to be able to say it. Sheikh Baya, do you feel comfortable by the way our discussion has been going so far in terms of the dilemmas, the challenges, and also the impossibilities sometimes of identifying those threats to open societies, even if governments want to secure uh, that open society? I think that, that what we're talking about is going in a good way. It's, it's this balance between freedom and between this, this uh, responsibility, B between our emotions and between our intellect. I want to add something. Those who do these things, yeah, and the, the, they, they're helping the, the terrorists. They want everybody to fight. So in that way, they want us all to be fighting each other. So, so so that there's nobody balanced anymore. So that if, if you're always cultivating uh, contempt uh, amongst people, then you're helping these people because this is what they want. They really want war and because war is based on contempt of the other. And so they have to feel some kind of responsibility here because they're helping the very enemies of these people. Let me um, uh, now uh, get a couple of other voices, if I may, please. Um, uh, firstly, to Bernadette Segor, welcome. Uh, uh, you're General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation. Open society, you're facing, you always face a lot of the trade unions challenges on this, and obviously uh, the mood can move in a different direction, but what's your reflection on this challenge now to an open society? Well, basically we believe that to have an open society you have to have a cohesive society and a cohesive society needs a, a stop to uh, unemployment and uh, education and integration of the various people who are in a very uh, difficult situation if you look at the roots of the problems you will quickly understand that uh, you know there is a problem with the banlieue in 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 france and uh, uh, the way the the people are developing. But at the same time, we believe in an open society because uh, trade union needs 
to this open society. We need to be able to say we disagree, even have cartoons to say about the employers what we think, uh, even if it is offending them, uh, because this is non-violent, it is expressing opinions. So I'm a bit afraid of, um, um, we, are not, we don't have to be politically correct all the time. We have to be able, our people have to be able to, what, to say what they have to say uh, without without being too politically correct. Do but they feel under threat at the moment then? Yes, they do. And uh, I, I think it is very dangerous. I think it is very dangerous. And what we are doing is trying to, on the contrary, to say, we need education, we need employment, we need to give them the possibility to integrate in our society to avoid this, uh, this type of uh, reaction. Let me go to Chris Seiple, if I can. Um, uh, you are chair of the Global Agenda Council uh, on the role of faith world e uh, here, and you speak regularly on the relationship between religion and real politique. What's your reflection on what you've been hearing? Uh, one, I'm greatly encouraged. This is exactly the kind of conversation we need to have, candidly uh, and courteously. Cur courteously. Uh, four quick comments. One is open society takes place on a spectrum between liberty and security, freedom to something and freedom from something. That gets defined differently in historical contexts and has to be done by society and state uh, together. Second is context. Terrible tragedy in Paris, but it took place in the context of almost 2,000 in Nigeria and 25,000 in Pakistan. Uh, let's have equal outrage all the time about this issue. On, uh, the rights and responsibilities. <clears throat> I'm the fourth of eight Marines over two generations of disciples who have worn a uniform so people could say what they want to say. We would die for that and I believe strongly in that. But on the other hand, there is also a thing that I believe, I'll call it maturity, that whatever our moral point of departure is, we have to exercise maturity in how we, and I define maturity as this, moving beyond tolerance to respect. I don't want to tolerate my neighbor, I want to celebrate my neighbor according to the essence of his or her identity. Last point is this, the question is how do you create an ongoing dialogue where trust can take place? And I'll give you just one example. I uh, co-founded a religious freedom roundtable in Washington. And if you've ever seen the movie Star Wars, it's kind of like the first bar scene that you see. Everybody in that room could not agree on anything politically or theologically but we share a firm and indefatigable commitment to the imperative of freedom of conscience or belief and mutual respect and mutual reliance. And that allows us from the bottom up, we meet on Capitol Hill to invite the top down of government into a sort of a track 1.5 ongoing dialogue where trust is built across sectors between public and private, top down and bottom up, and the social cohesion of this last point begins to result such that you don't have a divided and polarized society. Thank you. I want to go to, can I go to Mr. Grandelagen again? Um, can you help us understand, I think there's gonna be a, a session tomorrow between, uh, w w with some of your um, counterparts or one former counterpart um, from Britain tomorrow, but something that Ken Roth raised, and as you're inside, even though it's foreign intelligence, he made the point that actually the, 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 the two who were involved in Charlie Hebdo were talking on their wives' telephones. Where do you think the principles are now that you've got to violate freedom and free speech in the security services in order to guarantee security and free, security of a free society? Where is that debate going now, do you think, whether in Norway or more broadly among the others you talk to who are your compatriots in, other, in the same field in other countries? Yes, let me just say that, that I believe that both uh, the, the national security services and also the foreign intelligence agencies are faced with an extremely difficult task here in trying to prevent uh, the type of incidents that we have seen. And uh, I think that highlights 
very much the balance uh, um, uh, between uh, security, public security, national security, uh, and uh, the privacy of individuals. This is a balance that can only be uh, the, the balance can only be find, uh, found by our, our, our politicians. Uh, it is up to us in the intelligence agencies to argue uh, why uh, this is important. Um, I think a number of um, uh, and what kind of pushback do you get, for example, from the new government in Norway? I, I, think, I think we have a very good discussion in Norway on this issue for the time being, uh, and um, uh, in general, I think after the. The, 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 the Snowden leaks a year and a half ago, ago where, where this was highlight, highlighted very much, uh, I think uh, currently and, and globally there is a far more balanced uh, understanding uh, uh, of this issue uh, and the need to find solutions whereby um, society can take care of our common inter interests. Right, just before I ask uh, the panelists here, let me ask you again, what is your assessment as a very senior insider on this about the tolerance of the public now for its freedom to be challenged, maybe dig digitally as much as anything else, in order to guarantee security? Well, I can only uh, statistically uh, talk about the situation in Norway, but uh, polls that have been made suggest that the tolerance among uh, the public is pretty high for this. Uh, most, uh, most people will realize that if you don't use the methods that uh, foreign intelligence agencies can use and that security uh, services can use, it is going to be very, very difficult to prevent inc incidents like All this right. in the future. Pass the microphone along, but let me, what, what's your reaction? I mean, here you have the dilemma from a senior insider. What, what's your feeling about this dilemma and where the line is going to be in the future, particularly if there's going to be another threat to security, whether it be in the developed country. I was in Peshawar when, when 147, well, I was in Pakistan the day that happened, and that was a massive shock, the worst outrage since 2007, and no one knew it was coming. Jean. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's really challenging. I, I sort of I want to go back to something that you just said about sort of coming back around. If you had a room full of people, a room full of journalists from anywhere in the world, from Peshawar, from Kenya, from uh, Russia, from any, anywhere, that they would sort of come back to this fundamental principle of, of respecting freedom of expression. And so I think there would be a pushback from that community. Sometimes I'm surprised by the cultures and societies in which they work. And again, I view them, I mean, so many of them as heroes. But even in our own country, I know that I'm surprised at the welcome and openness to allowing such... such um, violations of our privacy. Sheikh Bayer, the level of tolerance and understanding when you hear a senior professional in the intelligence field reflecting the national security dilemmas when trying to maintain an open society and the maximum security as well. I think the intelligence people should be very, they have to be truthful and, and they have to be, because they can, they can help us avoid wars. They, they, can, they can see things that are coming in the future and, and they can prevent. So from that point of view, I, I, I respect what they're trying to do and I think it's important. Yeah, th this, this is also, yeah, it's a big problem. But if they do their work with the spirit of trying to prevent these dangers, but the most important thing, though, is the law. We, we have to have legislate laws that protect the, the rights. And also, you, you know, how do we protect religions? We're in a globalized world. We're all in the same place. The Internet has made us one culture now. How do we protect religions? What, it doesn't matter, any type of religion, whether it's the Abrahamic, the Jewish, the Christian, the, the, the Buddhist religion. How do, how do we protect their, their sacredness? Why can't we put some legislations to protect these religions? And if we just leave people to make fun of them that will lead to types of wars, we don't want wars. If you look at the religious wars, of the past, uh, we, it's horrible what's happened, and we're in the danger of having being confronted with new wars. Thank you. Uh, just before we, we, we wind up, and I go to Patrick and, and, and Ken, uh, Tricia, you wanted a quick word uh, behind me. Uh, it's, it's become slightly moot, and I, I don't want to keep harking back to Charlie Hebdo, but 
surely the word that we're all uh, afraid of is extremism, and, and it is extremism of violence. And, you know, we are using extremism at some point of expression as well. And I think the two are really sort of sacrificing the the universally poignant, which I think most of us would relate to. And I'm so sorry, but I couldn't hear what you were saying, Sheikh, because mine weren't working. But I'm just wondering whether this hour's worth of discussion is actually happening in the Muslim world. I'll come back to you. Were you able to... Vous avez entendu cette question? Est-ce que cette conversation, ça se passe dans le... Vous voulez que je parle français? <laughs> On peut parler le français. Mais vous n'avez pas l'écouteur là. Uh, uh, maybe he could translate. Uh, let me just go, let, let, let me, let me uh, an instant. Let me just get a reflection because we're running out of time. Ken, uh, okay, we were never going to resolve this in an hour. But have we adequately reflected many of the dilemmas that you see and you chart day by day, hour by hour um, in the Human Rights Watch? People often say we've got to restrict our rights for security. That's often the way it's couched. And what I want to leave people with is you've got to look at that trade-off very carefully. For example, the idea that we are going to restrict um, you know, blasphemy to protect religion. If you look at how that plays out in a place like Pakistan, which has a very active blasphemy law, it's always the embattled minority who is imprisoned or sometimes killed. Um, it's never the majority. It's applied very selectively. If you look at the, the mass snooping, the mass collection of our metadata, um, when, when the NSA was asked, give us one terrorist plot that was broken up because of that mass collection of, of our metadata, they couldn't do it. So we have to really question whether these restrictions on our rights, supposedly in the name of security, are really necessary, or whether people are just taking advantage of a security threat to restrict our rights. Thank you. Patrick, and then I'll come uh, to the Sheikh. This, this question about an open society, and I'm going back to where I started with you, yeah. um, about whether you fear there will be a sense of constraint if this were to happen again. First, I don't think we, we will agree on a single universal global sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> this will not happen. So That now, wasn't the point of discussion, though. Can I, we have I a national... I would love, after... Again, it goes back to the, the Danish cartoons. It's, it's been 10 years. I would like to, us to get out of that vicious circle. I'm tired of that, of that thing. Let's name things. It, is the, it has become a symbol. The sticking point is the, is the image of the prophet. That's, that has become a symbol of many other things. It, it is not, let's, let's put that aside. I'm, I mean, we won't, we won't make laws to forbid you know, any cartoon about the prophet, but we, I can say, let's put aside Muhammad, let's not draw that, because it has become a symbol. On one side, as if all of our uh, you know, democracies and, and, and freedoms and values resided on, on that sim single thing, I mean, the image of the prophet, and on the other side, it's a symbol of many other things, of frustration, of, uh, of uh, social issues, religious issues, and it's th those symbols are being utilized and I think the crowds, and uh, particularly uh, people in the, in, the, in the Islam world, need to understand that there is manipulation going on. But we need to, at some point, uh, break the vicious circle. All right. I'm sorry, um, Sheikh Baya, I've got to stop it because the next session starts in 10 minutes. Can I thank you all very much? Actually, in, in an open society, we didn't get many tweets, but B Victoria Medina has just tweeted, potential rupture and extremism. We have to consider our actions have consequences and can boomerang on us. Can I thank you all very much indeed. We're never going to resolve this, but at least we've aired it at a critical time. And thank you to my panelists. Thank you.